Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Hello and welcome to another episode of Wilms Front. Uh, tonight it is Wednesday 9th of October 2019 at 7pm uh, here in Melbourne. We're live on YouTube and soon we'll be in Entropy. Now I've got a very special guest with me tonight, uh, twice elected City of Casey Councillor Rosalie Cristani representing Four Oaks Awards. Welcome. Thank you Tim for having me. Now you're a pillar of the, the local Casey community but you've had a vast life experience. You're born in Western Australia. You're brought up and still are a devout Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, had mission work in the United States, Papua New Guinea and remote indigenous communities. You've worked in medical services support. Uh, you're a personal fitness fanatic, a small businesswoman and a proud mother of two. Uh, right. So you're first elected to the city of Casey in 2012. And then you joined uh, Danny Nialia. Did I say that right? Nalaya. Nalaya, mm -hmm. Rise Up Australia Party and became deputy president of it in 2015, you became mm -hmm. a deputy mayor of the city of Casey in uh, 2018. Right. Uh, Rise Up Australia, it's, you describe it as a multi-ethnic Australian patriotic and values party. That's correct. And you've stood in state and federal elections over the past decade. That's correct. Have I left anything out? Probably, but that's, that's good. That's a good snapshot. Uh, now, I'll just get us on Entropy, uh, in, in case you don't know what uh, Entropy is, it's a YouTube enhanced uh, software, which means you can ask Rosalie questions uh, later tonight, and you can also uh, send through uh, Super Chats, which I'll, I'll read your comments out live on air. I'm just going to put the, the link in the chat, and I'll get us up there. Now you're my second guest uh, in the studio and we coordinated a bit uh, better than uh, my first guest, um, uh, Alan Moran. I've decided when I've got somebody in the studio now, mm -hmm. just going to be a full show with them rather than just going through the, the news cycle. I'll probably save that to Friday evening where I, mm -hmm. last week I did a, a double episode both I had a guest via Skype and I also uh, did a, a news summary. Excellent. Uh, so I will get to the news weekend. but just not tonight. I uh, see so you'll be able to see the live chat from here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's the link to Entropy, so come and join us over there. All right, now, I, I wanted to talk about, as I promoted, the, the city of Casey. It's basically a, a, a snapshot of uh, what's the, the demographic change in Australia and, and more multiculturalism. Now, the city of Casey is located in southern eastern Melbourne. I grew up on the, the Frankston, Mornington Peninsula, so, uh, which is near there. So I've had many family and friends from uh, Casey. It's a rapidly growing and changing area. It was created uh, during the Kennet uh, Council amalgamations. They merged mm -hmm. the city of Garrick mm -hmm. and Shire of Cranbourne. It takes in the, the federal seats of Holt, which is Safe Labour, and Latrobe, which it's a it's normally a liberal seat but it can can swing to to labor like it did in in 2010. yes that's right and then mm -hmm. the, it covers the state seats of cranbourne narry warren north and narry warren south mm -hmm. and also jembrook the the main uh, uh, population centers are narry warren and, and cranbourne and fountain gate uh, shopping center that's basically the central hub that's where the, the council building is where a lot of other things that most people know fountain gate as where kath and kim used to go shopping but it's actually nowhere near like what if uh, this the sort of middle of what kath and kim represents as suburbia that's right well kath and kim i haven't seen them there ever <laughs> no well they filmed it actually at southland oh, okay yes yes now, at the 2016 census, it said that it had a population city of Casey of uh, 300,000, but you've just filled me in, it's now 355,000 uh, residents. That's correct. So it's growing 10,000 people a year, and it's set to grow to half a million by 2040. Wow. So it's yeah. because, yeah, I drive past there regularly. There's always a new housing estate saying this is the, this is the place. And it has attracted a lot of families because 
the the birth rate is what's well, near replenishment rate 1.9 uh, per family and what I found interesting 53.8 percent uh, married this is all based on the 2016 yes. census and obviously we've seen marriage uh, devalued mm -hmm. uh, so much in the past you'd probably say 40 years yes that's right and but you have a majority married there I was I was quite that is encouraging and it is true and it, it, it uh, I, t I completely understand those figures and why it would be. I thought it might be a little bit more and we have a high migrant population there as well and they do value marriage very much. And obviously it's a high immigrant uh, area, mm -hmm. uh, place of birth Australia is still the majority at 56.2% of residents. That's right. Then second is, is India at 6.0, uh, then Sri Lanka at 3.8. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, your party founder and leader, Danny Nialia, he was uh, Sri Lankan. That's correct. And Afghanistan, 2.9% as well. So it's it, it's fair to say that it's uh, immigrants from the subcontinent that tend to settle. Do you think that's the uh, intentional? Yeah, well, I mean, I attend most of the citizenship ceremonies and those figures actually represent what I see coming through the doors. And that is uh, Indian first mm -hmm. and Sri Lankan. Uh, there is an element of Chinese that come through as well. But yes, definitely Afghanistan. Uh, and there's just a variety. UK shows up as well. Um, but yes, high level of Indian that, have, that are coming into case. There was actually an article in The Age a few weeks back, I'm not sure if you saw it, talking about how the, the, the massive uh, Indian uh, settlement in Cranbourne. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't see that, but no, that, that's certainly, I'm aware, of, I'm aware of the high Indian population there. And more mm -hmm. interesting statistic is the, the origin of parents. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, both parents born here, 31%, uh, but yes. both born overseas, 53%. Well, it's interesting because m m myself and my husband, three out of four of our parents were born overseas. So it, it does, I mean, those figures are certainly there for sure. We are a highly um, multi-ethnic community. But it's not just like, obviously, we, we looked at the, the places of birth, the subcontinent, countries are most prominent but as you mentioned there there's plenty of European mm -hmm. immigration there new Australians yes. black brown or white settled there mm -hmm. absolutely and it's also quite a religious uh, place 53% mm -hmm. uh, identify as some form of Christian mm -hmm. denomination 25% uh, express no religion uh, Islam, which is obviously you pose the, the Islamization of the, the area, uh, the adherence to that is 7.4% in the, the city of Casey. Yes, so it's not surprising those figures. So the Christian element, I and mean, we've been dubbed the Bible Belt of the Southeast, and we actually wear that as a badge of honor for sure. Those Christian uh, representation, those values that are, we, that are fostered there is, is certainly uh, one of our greatest strengths. Uh, if I look back at subsequent councils and councillors, most of them are Christian and are Christian. And that's a, rep that's a snapshot, a representative of, of our community. Yeah. Now, let's talk about how you got elected to the City mm -hmm. of Casey Council. When did you actually arrive in the area? I couldn't find that out. When I was first moved to the City of Casey, when I was 18. Um, I've lived in the city of Casey and served uh, for over 20 years, um, so elected and re-elected for seven years. Um, and so I've lived in about three or four suburbs of the city of Casey, Cranbourne, Endeavour Hills, Narry Warren, Aberic. Um, so I've, I've lived at Narry North as well, of course. Um, so I've, I've sort of gotten a feel for the area for sure. I liked how you described that without revealing your age. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to give you too much. <laughs> no, oh, I didn't actually find that out myself, but it doesn't... I'm 45. I've got no qualms about that. <laughs> there you go. So the way that Victorian local government elections work is that all councils go to an election for fixed four-year terms. That's right. And so that started in 2008, okay. around about... Oct Oct is it always in October? Yes, yes, it is always October. So you were first elected October uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. Now... You don't win by simply paying your nomination fee, having a nice blurb in the the mailing ballot that's sent out to, because yeah, ba uh, back in the early days, that's how basically I, I made mm. my mind up, just reading the blurb. And basically who uh, was promising to leave me alone the most, that's who I'd vote for. <laughs> I'll have to remember that for the next campaign yes, material. <laughs> because they all have their grand plans mm. for how they're going to, to do mm. things and involves, well, when they say they're going to do things, it involves using ratepayers' money. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, this is it. Look, I'm a rate pay myself, so I want to be responsible for mm. the money. But as far as the way I was re elected, I mean, I, I listened to those who had already been elected. I had gotten to know a few of the councillors, um, but I, I walked the streets, put the flyers out. I shook hands at shopping centres. Um, I did all those things and put up posters, had them torn down for more up. So uh, look, I, I worked heavily, I raised funds um, and I did it all without, you know, dodgy Chinese campaign donations. Yeah, because the expression is campaigning your socks off. That's that's what yes. you did. That's what you have to do to, to win. Mm -hmm. You can even lose and, and still, like, you've still got to do that. Yes, that's right. To even have a, have a chance. That's right. And look, the preferences played a role. So the idea was try to get as many good preferences as you could. But I did it without dummy candidates. So I'm really proud of that because I was told you can't win without dummy candidates. And um, I, yeah, I, I showed the, the opposite that you can. That, that's quite uncommon sometimes, somebody who, who, who doesn't want to engage in, in dirty tricks, but you still won. Well, I look, I put it down to my faith as well, because I, I did say, God, look, I had this little tussle with God. I said, God, I can't win if I don't do this, this and this. And I, I felt that, you know, my conscience was killing me if I put a flyer up the wrong area or uh, did anything that was out of. But look, I think that's, um, that's how I kept it clean. I actually also uh, decided I was not going to throw mud at my competitors. I think that was important that um, that you kept it clean and uh, above board and um, try to respond to those who were attacking you. And I and I and I did. As long as you're confident in your convictions, you can fight back any accusations that's that's thrown at you and that's what you've done since you first were elected that's right well look i haven't always done well in in some things but i look i hope to think the community know i have their back that's the primary um primary thing, and so that i'm holding true to my convictions and living them out now uh, you quickly became widely known just not in the city of casey area but uh, you, you were on a few mainstream media uh, shows uh, uh, for opposing local mosque uh, developments in the, the, the city of, of Casey. Now, mm -hmm. I just want to get uh, clear your views on Islam and why you have them. So, Yeah. First, I'll address, if you don't mind, um, why I'd oppose those mosques. And first of all, as the community told me, they didn't want them. So as an elective representative, I was very clear that I had to voice their concerns. And that led to me... Um, moving recommendations to refuse and oftentimes being successful. Uh, views on Islam, I'm very against Islamic Sharia law. I think it's um, demoralising for both men and women and I think it has no place in Australia. So um, I could go into greater detail but basically I just want everyone who resides in the city of Casey and beyond um, to live in a safe area. I've made a commitment to the city of Casey residents that I would always aim to provide a peaceful and united um, city with purpose, safety and security. That's been my vision. So that doesn't matter if you're Muslim or Hindu or Christian, whatever you are, but you are to live with the values in which we espouse at the city of Casey. Now the census only lists the, the top uh, religions there. I assume mm -hmm. that in Casey, being multi-ethnic, there's there's Hindus, there's mm -hmm. Buddhists, there's Sikhs. Yes. And there's like, obviously they have their their places of, of worship there. I assume there hasn't been any issues with with those. Um, there has, there has. Um, but I think the mosques have been the more concern for the community. And um, look, there's always been parking issues with with a lot of temples and places of worship but the ones you hear about the most are the mosques and that's community members ringing me emailing me and I'm not talking one or two I'm talking dozens hundreds over all those years now obviously the the media and your political opponents would like to portray you as some sort of lone nut but as you mentioned you were uh, responding to community concerns did were there other councillors as well obviously mm -hmm. you're the most well known but other councillors who were heeding these concerns from ratepayers and residents? Oh yes, absolutely. And um, I did stand alone in 2013 with the first MOSS application that was brought before us. Um, but since then, uh, there has been a unanimous support, um, sorry, unanimous opposition against a MOSS in Narry North in 2016. Uh, there has also been the, the recent decision made, unfortunately, that um, didn't, that, uh, 
um, the, the residents voiced their concern about the Narry North Moss when they reapplied, sorry, and um, there was only three of us out of 10 that uh, refused the mosque. Um, so that, that is what the, where the numbers lie at the moment. And now, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you joined the, the Rise Up Australia party in, in 2013, which was after you were elected. Uh, Danny Nealia, he's based in that area as well, the Catch the Fire Ministries, that's in Hallam, I believe that's right. it is, yes. That's right. So we're now renamed Reformation Harvest Fire, but um, absolutely, Danny Nealia has been a, a real um, bastion of strength. He, is, he was sued by the Islamic Council of Victoria in 2002 um, for quoting violent verses out of the Quran. Yes, he was so, the, the first big target of the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. You, you know very well. So. So he had broken, he had actually won that, that case. It took five years and $2.1 million, some, wow. some pro bono, but um, that was a win for all Australians because that set a precedence and that has been represented in 80 court cases across the country and across the world. So uh, look, that is something, um, it's given me the freedom in order to represent my community's views because a lot of people fear for speaking out, but they, empower me to be able to do their speaking for them and interesting enough being a voice of the people i've only got them to answer to and of course god so i'm okay with that i don't you know people have tried to get me out of council and things like that but the community made it very clear that they want me back in so um, being that when the narry north mosque was um, first applied for uh, three months later uh, i was re-elected and so it was fresh in people's minds that I was willing to voice their concerns on that particular application. And I know exactly what you mean, that people, they, they feel they can't speak up. And that's what I've noticed with a lot of my work with the Unshackled and what I'm aiming to do is basically helping in, people to empower them to, to speak up because a lot of the comments we get it's like wow this is so refreshing yes. like, I'm glad someone's saying this absolutely I'm, I'm glad you're not of the left persuasion because mm. we've got a plethora of that mm. can I just bring up something that um, back in a, a date that will be etched in my memory forever and that is September 23rd 2014 a lot of people have heard of Sydney siege but they've never heard or, or they've forgotten about the first ever Islamic State terrorist attack on Australian soil, which occurred at the Endeavour Hills Police Station, which is in the ward that I represent, but it also uh, is actually only five minutes from the proposed site of this Narry North Mosque. Now that's where a young fella... Yeah, the Endeavour Hills one, yeah, I remember. He tried to behead two federal police officers. So, um, you know, that was actually the first one before, and then three months later, the Sydney siege. And we, hear, we still hear about that in the media. But I never want anyone to forget about the risks that are associated with um, extreme and fundamental Islam teachings. And there was links drawn to the existing mosque in the city of Casey in Hallam to that young fella. So when that happened, it only uh, firmed my resolve to represent the community on this issue if they had concerns about mosques. And coupled with that, and then there was the most high profile, the Sydney siege in uh, December 2014. That's right. And then beginning in 2015, that's when the, the Reclaim Australia movement was formed, which Rise Up uh, participated in. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there was uh, Sherman Burgess, he became quite prominent uh, in it, and he uh, split off to form the United Patriots Front, which its centrepiece activism was opposing the uh, proposal to construct a mosque in, in Bendigo, which has, has just broken ground uh, recently this year, and Daniel Andrews has, has given it a, a few hundred thousand uh, dollars, uh, but that was, it, like, people say that they're all outsiders, but it was, like, I've spoken to activists who are still in Bendigo, and yes. it was a local groundswell there, and mm -hmm. the people that came were from outside we're basically like yeah we want to help you mm -hmm. protect your your town as well we're not, we we don't want what's happened elsewhere to happen in Bendigo that's right I emceed most of those rallies and I was at that that um, Bendigo mosque rally um, with other Patriot groups so Rise Up had a presence there Daniel Nalaya um, he spoke as well so absolutely it was that groundswell support was evident. We had quite a few contacts in Bendigo as well, so we do know that there was local support. 
And this was the beginning of, uh, I'm coining a new term tonight, the swastika terror, which is where the, the left and the media, they started to believe that the Nazis were, <laughs> were coming back. And they still believe this to their day. They're, I noticed just on Twitter every now and then, Nazis is, is trending. <laughs> they're, they're concerned about yeah. new Nazis. And it's, it's, it's just thrown around all the, all, all the time. Like I've coughed a few times. Yes, I bet you have. Um, look, the best defence for our that so-called label that we were try to be painted with was Daniel, the colour of our president's skin. He's mm. black, and he says he's black. So, um, and uh, you know, I've got Jewish heritage, a small percentage of Jewish heritage. Uh, there is so many different ethnic groups in, in our patriotic, um, in our Rise Up Australia uh, group that um, it, it's it is its own defence. And um, look, you know, th there has been people that have come, turned up to a rally with a swastika once, once or twice, but that's, that would be a very small, rare majority, ra minority rather than, than the, the feeling of the crowd. So I've made it clear when I was at uh, MCing, I said, we don't believe in Nazism here. We don't support racism. So I made it very clear when I opened these rallies that that's not where, what we're on about. But of course, the media didn't, mm. it didn't um, show that, did they? It's interesting in the current, not just the Extinction Rebellion mm -hmm. protests, but the other ones, they have the hammer and sickle flag as well. And that mm -hmm. should be treated just as offensively as a, as a mm -hmm. swastika. That mm -hmm. represents a, a nation that killed millions. Mm -hmm. Well, look, anything that's, um, yeah, that's explicitly racist, of course. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, you got uh, re-elected in 2016 and uh, obviously you had a lot thrown at you, but because you were seen as the the voice of what well, it used to be called the the silent majority but scott morrison's coined the term now the quiet australians which mm -hmm. i think is actually a, a better one because it's it it just it describes how quiet australians they they know how they want to live australians basically mm -hmm. just want to be left alone raise their families yes. uh, but they they won't be so quiet occasionally that's right look australians as i see it and particularly uh, i've come to understand people in the city of casey they're quite, they're fiercely protective of their area, but they do want to just get on with their lives, raise their kids, go about their work, you know, ha have a barbecue once in a while and, and watch the footy and play footy too. Uh, I love Australia. I think we're a great nation. Um, I find that it, it is unnerving sometimes to think, am I, am I actually doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing on behalf of the community? Because sometimes you'll be, they'll be quiet, they'll be quiet on certain issues but then when it comes to a vote they will be with you I mean I've been sent many emails and that over the time sometimes more than others but you think am I doing the right thing but they assure me that yes absolutely they want to protect the community just as much as I do um, and that's what makes this community great I mean it's shown for instance in our military it's shown in uh, history when Australians go to war we anyone knows that if you go to war you want an australian with you they are good they're good fun but they also they'll go and fight with their their life they will lay down their life and they are fiercely protective of of um of each other uh, and their friends so having said that uh, is what, what's anzac day attendance like in the, the city of casey is yeah i look from what i understand it has been a slow grow from the 80s it had a res resurgence really in in the early 2000s um, and we've seen i've seen it grow and i've attended the dawn services at the city of casey in my capacity as deputy mayor and, and councillor and i've seen them grow into thousands i mean i'm so impressed that people are are actually showing the honor the anzacs deserve i mean we're just about to celebrate um october 31st the battle of Beersheba, with over 100 years ago and the light horsemen charged Beersheba and took that that key stronghold which ultimately um, helped return Israel back to the Jews so I had to put that in there because that's pretty pretty significant yeah well that's we, good to hear it is Yom Kippur today oh is it yes <laughs> yes now obviously you mentioned there that they're very protective the the residents of Casey of their uh, lives and yeah they uh, they they want to protect their community mm -hmm. and i just want to mention this as well your email address your city of casey email address you read all those emails you don't have staff or anything it goes directly to you no that's right i in fact i welcome 
everyone to write to me uh, directly if they obviously if there's issues that they can't sort out through other channels through customer service and that they write to me usually on the two hard basket issues so that's where I get involved and I um, I uh, step in and see if I can do anything to be the conduit between them and council um, so uh, look I don't have a PA we do have council support staff which is great and we do have a, a great um, executive management team that we can draw upon for their skills and that. But yes, I do answer phone calls. People are a bit shocked. I can't believe that you pick up the phone and answer my call. I said, well, I should <laughs> um, fit it in amongst everything. But I, yeah. Yeah. And counsellors, they're part time. They Yes, that's they, right. They, they, don't, they get a part time wage. Is the, because I know with mayors, it's, mm. it, it varies from, is the mayor get a full time salary or are they full time? They do. They get ninety five thousand, I think, a year. We get about councillors get about thirty three thousand. Even deputies get the same, and that is oftentimes I, like when I first looked at the snapshot of it, the hours I put in, I was getting paid below minimum wage. But mm. I'm not, you know, we're, it's an honour to represent the community, and it's there's something pretty pure about the fact that you don't get paid a lot, but you you know, you make decisions that impact um, thousands and, and, and also you uh, convene over almost $600 million budget a year, half a billion dollars of people's money, you want to get it right. But it, it's almost like it can be trusted because someone's not doing it for the money. Yes. And, and that's the big debate. Like, should politicians be paid more to attract uh, better people or should they be paid less because you want to attract people who are uh, dedicated to public service? Mm -hmm. and. I think this word public public service when somebody's getting paid a full time wage to, to to basically be a ribbon cutter that's not really public service. Look, it goes beyond. We've been accused of being just ceremonial and and. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't oh, no, referring no, to I'm counselors. Just, yeah, no, that's okay. But I've cut a few ribbons, and I'll be. I'm very honoured to do that. It is so diverse that the job, one minute you will be standing on someone's nature strip about a tree and the next minute you will be um, trying to, uh, you know, dissolve a conflict um, between neighbours um, and, and there's all sorts of things that you end up doing and convene the budget as, as I was saying. We're, we're quite a diverse role. We turn up to different community groups and people want to see us on the ground um, and it is, we're trying to fit it in with, with everyday lives and families and it's it's a real it's it's fantastic being able to undertake the role of counsellor. Now I've got a super chat here from Port Film Co-op for three uh, US dollars. I'm not going to read it out because uh, I appreciate the the three dollars, but uh, I'm I'm not going to put that in the middle of my <laughs> interview with Rosalie. I'm not sure what it means. Yes, but, but we do have a question here, <laughs> which is uh, more constructive from Alpha Chat. Uh, what are your economic views? Are you mm -hmm. against deregulation, privatisation and welfare cuts? Mm. So to try to answer those things, so um, economic, economic views, they tend to be somewhere in the middle. So I'm not a socialist, I'm not a capitalist as such. I am, I'm somewhere in the middle where you should honour the people for their hard work. At the same time, don't encourage laziness. Um, so privatization I think that has led to a huge energy bills oh my goodness um, and uh, without the proper government regulation on those as well um, I didn't catch the other part of that question but um, welfare cuts welfare cuts so no I, I do believe that um, we should be looking after uh, those who need the money uh, at the same time responsible work for the doll those sorts of initiatives but if if we've got good rigorous um, workplace laws that are looking after not only the employee but employers and uh, a, a good morale that's cultivated in a workplace then there shouldn't be the need for as many people to leave work um, and uh, I think that this whole push for greed in, in whoever is doing it on which other, uh, um, whichever side should be I think we should lessen that real desire to take what, what is in ours in wherever that lays uh, and to work hard. So it sounds like you believe in social democracy. That's that's probably where I define in terms of uh, economics. And like obviously, you're pro uh, people would define you as a social conservative, which in the rigid left-right divide, people would think that you believe in really small government and uh, a deregulated uh, free market. But there's actually, in terms of those who 
uh, fit under the definition of social conservatism on the economic matters, there's wide variety of views. Mm -hmm. Yes, I probably yeah that that would probably be a good explanation of what I believe. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done on our economics, and we certainly haven't. Um, we certainly need to. The government needs to step up. Uh, a lot of fronts need to be sorted out. We're making good time tonight. It's just past uh, seven thirty. Okay. Uh, but we're f <laughs> fitting everything in, which is good. Dear won't be mad uh, if I go over time eight fifteen. Now, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, uh, city of Casey is a very family oriented area, and in beginning in twenty fifteen, and then it really came to the forefront in twenty sixteen. The the Safe Schools uh, program, which mm -hmm. is well, was sold as an anti-bullying program, but it was revealed that it's rooted in cultural Marxist mm. LGBT ideology. And once people actually, because this, this is the thing, people are so busy living their lives. And I find that parents these days are way too trusting of, mm. of schools and they view schools probably too much as daycares. Mm. and so this program was able to be snuck in with yes. not many people knowing what, what what was in it and what their children were learning. Mm. But the city of Casey basically became campaign HQ against the program. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you refer to it as the, the Bible Belt of um, the, the Southeast. And I, obviously, because I'm a local near the area, I remember all the, the information sessions, both at you hosted some at, at council. There were also a lot of community ones that at churches mm -hmm. and all of the, the activist groups that were all based in Cranbourne. Yes, that's right. Well, I think there's two people who are uh, two groups that are responsible for this whole madness, and that is um, the madness of the actual curriculum itself. And that is, of course, the influence through the state education department and the, the imposition on schools to adopt this, this program and the and the also um, rewards to do that and giving him money to actually run these programs. So I didn't think anything was wrong with our anti-bullying programs before this sort of madness got introduced. And I hate the deceptive language, um, safe schools, where it's extremely unsafe and they've tried to politicize a small section of a demographic, uh, the LBGTI community, in order to to um, shove it down people's throat. Now, Tim, do you, if you don't mind, I want to rewind back to 2014. And that is when I spoke up about um, the promotion of homosexuality at the detriment of heterosexuality at council. And I started seeing a lot of left ideas infiltrate and started being um, filtered through into uh, committees and even committee I was chairing on um, and uh, putting it in media releases and even displaying uh, gay lobby signs in the public area, you know, in, in public areas and in staff areas. And I spoke up about this and I was absolutely slammed. I will not begin to tell you. It was a long pathway to the conduct panel. And in the end, they couldn't get me on freedom of speech, but they got me on calling someone a bully and, and something, another technicality. The reality is I've, I've actually paid the price for speaking up on this, on this sort of issue. Um, at the same time, I've uh, it's it's firmed my resolve to not let any children be at risk of exposure to this this sort of madness because this is if you put everything else aside except look at the figures and you see that you've got an um, when there a child is actually uh, encouraged to go through surgery to have become transsexual um, there is an there is an increased rate of uh, something in the order of eighty percent suicide rate. For any child, or for any anyone that becomes, the amount of mental illness increase by actually having surgery and other impacts of, of hormone therapy and that sort of thing, it is nothing short of horrific child abuse. So that's just one element, and there's other subtle elements that, that you know, the rest of the population has to promote this stuff when it goes against their core beliefs. Uh, I'm reading a book at the moment called The Madness of Crowds, Douglas Murray, I don't know if you heard of it. Yes, he, it's, he's been doing on the, the publicity tour yes. on all the, the talk shows. Yeah, I haven't read the full book yet, but he says a line in there, he says, nothing more demeaning and, and soul destroying than trying to have to be forced to agree and uh, accept and promote something that you do not believe, that is against your, your, um, your convictions. And so that is why... Um, 
I've moved a motion to have a forum, um, a safe school, at, well, anti safe schools forum at council uh, in response to the community. You almost got stopped, and thank goodness there was um, the, the local laws was on our side, uh, as in the actual um, legislation, and we were able to find a way to conduct that forum. We've been working in conjunction with, um, also outside of council, even working in conjunction with the cause group who we had, um, we uh, fund, we helped fund, but also circulate and authorize their material before the um, the last federal election. Unfortunately, we didn't get the response that we hoped. It seems like people are falling asleep at the wheel. Australians um, are in a little bit disbelief that surely this couldn't be happening. And like you said, it's almost treating school as a babysitter, um, uh, you know, as babysitters and you know surely this can't be you know the madness that comes from that and and um, all the programs that are associated but surely enough there has been stories and i know one lady who was a was on the board of cause whose son ended up in the emergency department yes with I, I know. oh you know Marjana. yeah so you know i know those those there is actual evidence so you, i challenged the state department i had there was someone that came to council and i said look this stuff is happening oh no 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 it's not happening and so I'm just, I'm, it, ha, it has to take Australians, parents, to stand up and not elect the same government back in. They have, they chose to at the last state election. I know there's a lot of good the Labor government does and, and I know our council community works very well on multiple fronts, you know, infrastructure and roads and great work and no doubt about that. It's just the social issues are so horrific from abortion, euthanasia, safe schools and all this uh, sexualization of children is where they fall over unfortunately and i think that it's australia has to wake up and in the state election year 2018 there was a lot of activism ag against safe schools again centered in in cranbourne there was the the, the rally against uh, safe schools at, at parliament house in, yes. in april you spoke at that that was yes. organized by uh, cause and um uh, Margena's uh, Stop Sexualising Children mm -hmm. movement as well, yes. and that was uh, quite decently uh, attended and caused, mm -hmm. uh, they released promotional videos during the, the election, information videos during the election campaign, letterboxing, yes. and there was a big uh, push because three of the four City of Casey seats, uh, Cranbourne, Narriwarren North and Narriwarren South, they're held by, they were held by Labour, mm -hmm. by not many percentage points and mm -hmm. so the Liberal Party selected three candidates who were, were solid on mm -hmm. their primary concern mm -hmm. was uh, the safe schools program but they're also locals to the area they cared about the, yes. the local community uh, there was uh, Susan Suri in Narriwarren South uh, Narriwarren North uh, Vicky Fitzgerald I saw mm -hmm. a lot of the the information things I was at as well mm -hmm. and also Anne-Marie Hermans in, in Cranbourne I saw her at a lot of these uh, events as well and they to use the expression again campaign their their socks off they were mm -hmm. door knocking mm -hmm. they had plenty of, of volunteers they, they put in really good effort but in Cranbourne there was a 8% uh, swing to Labour Nary Warren North 5% swing to Labour Narrow on South, a uh, 2% uh, swing to Labour and Jembrook, which was seen as a very safe Liberal uh, seat. Uh, Brad mm -hmm. Batten, he was, well, he was already an MP, but he had an 8% swing against him, nearly mm -hmm. lost. Yes. And given that City of Casey, as you described it, is the Bible Belt of, of, this, of Melbourne, and given that that was campaign HQ for these mm -hmm. cultural and social issues, mm -hmm. How did Labor manage to turn like these marginal seats into safe seats in the 2018 election? Yeah. Well, some of it I'm an internal of it observer, but I'm also a slightly outward observer being um, with Rise Up. I knew each of those, and I still do know each of those candidates. Susan Saray, I served with on council. She's still, a, we were elected in the same year, 2012. She's been a deputy mayor as well. And I know that they're each brilliant women and also Brad has been a long serving member. And I, I was shocked like many that I didn't see a greater result for them. The only thing that I would say as an assessment um, is that they probably targeted some of the wrong things. Um, and look, you know, I can, it's easy for me to be a commentator um, in, in, you know, but I do ascribe their work was, you know, they, they did campaign their socks off. They were very top notch 
the candidates. Um, the thing is that I do know some of the Labor people too, and some of them are brilliant as well. I mean, it is always going to be hard to beat um, uh, those who you know have some local support as well. There is this understanding that um, Labor represents the working class, the and, and that's probably what it was traditionally. It's changed a little bit now, um, but they they you know they've found some good campaigning methods and uh, they've worked hard on social media as well, the Labor people. Um, look, there's a, probably a lot of facets that they could do to unpack that. Um, I would have to say that the social, that, sorry, the social issues with safe schools probably wasn't as important to people. And that's what I'm saying. I believe they've fallen asleep at the wheel. Uh, Australians have and not taking this as serious an issue as what those candidates were and should, you know, rightly so. Um, I think roads and, you know, traffic congestion, decongestion was more important to um, the public at that time and probably still is in a way. City of Casey, as you know, with the growth, the infrastructure is one of the greatest challenges and we've been doing great work with this, you know, with the local and federal, sorry, state and federal governments in order to, un, you know, decongest and, and that sort of thing. So that's probably my answer. The short answer is probably campaigned, um, although it was from the heart and it was rightly so, it wasn't what the public was most concerned about, unfortunately. And that, in a way, it's disappointing um, in that way. Um, but I think, though, if you're in a position of power and you have the influence and the power to do something about children's vulnerability and you don't, I'm, I'm getting a little bit emotional about this, there will be, there will be um, flow on effect, there will be... Um, repercussions and I'm, I don't mean that in a threat or anything I'm just saying you reap what you sow and eventually there will be people growing up probably suing certain people saying this was shoved down my throat at safe schools and and, and I have been turned out like this and I blame the state government of the day and I don't know who they'll be able to sue at the time but I'll just say that if you, you look Tim I've always said you can't polish a turd and they tried they've polished a turd with safe, the safe schools yeah which is well you have to give them credit for doing something like that but even though it's it's quite abhorrent but I have a similar view to you in that because because I mentioned that parents are so disconnected now and they see these stories about what's actually in safe schools they they skim through it it's like oh it can't be that bad that's probably just a you know, that's sort of their their attitude and because there's so few parents that are fully informed mm -hmm. and this is speaking to various people the the principal school administrators have been very good at just sidelining them uh, they're just a a fringe uh, person don't worry everything's under control mm -hmm. here that's right and the, the problem is is I mean, anyone we have a high migrant population who have lived under communism so they understand what it's like to live under a system that tries to take rights away from parents and sort of the, take the children off the parents in a way and indoctrinate and um and this is the same sort of underlying marxism as which is obviously the the groundwork for communism and and so in though how it's evidenced is you know, taking the kids with, don't tell the parents we're going to show this movie or don't, you know, and it's really quite horrifying. I want to know what my kids are watching. I want to know um, so I can, you know, and I may let them watch certain things, but I want to be able to educate them at the same time so that they say, look, this is what someone believes or this is what this is way. But as a parents, we should be informed and have say, but if you are targeting primary school children, the gloves are off. I'm coming for you because you leave the children alone. You leave the primary school children alone and let them grow up. Let the parents but do the work. As we've seen, like with the 2018 result, it's going to be a long, slow process to, because this is something that's been 30 years in the works, if not mm. more, or at least many decades in the, in, in the works. And so it's very hard to, because they've captured the, the education system as a whole from the department, mm. teachers unions and so it's it's a much much more bigger fight than just one state election cycle. If history goes on the way and, and future goes on the way that recent history has, I'm afraid you're probably right. I hope to think that there will be some you know, circuit breaker. I hope that there's a number of circuit breakers. It may be we have a fallen economy where um, we're in a different environment than we ever will be, you know, have been before. It may be 
a huge crisis on our soil um, that it will wake the people up and saying what it is what is it that we're fighting for what are we valuing what is our identity and our children um, collateral damage in our you know distractions so I hope to see I hope that that's not the case and I'd like to do something about it sooner rather than later. Um, I'm chewing at the bit <laughs> to be able to do, and that's why I take up every opportunity to talk about this. Um, uh, Tim, thank you for, for truly giving me an unshackled environment in order to speak, because there's been so many that have tried to silence me on this issue. And, um, but yeah, I hope there's hope for Australia for sure. Well, I've got a few unshackled questions. Okay. Uh, Dia Beltran, who is on air uh, in half an hour, she sent through three uh, US dollars. Thank you very much. Rosalie, uh, does you being a woman affect anything in your career or is it not mentioned? You know, that's, yes, there is, that, yes and no. So I will ju I'll just say, explain that a bit better. So thank you very much for your question, Dia. Um, so as a woman, it's been fantastic that at council we're actually almost genderless in a way and why I say that is it doesn't often come up it rarely comes up I see a fellow councillor as as just that councillor and what they stand for and you know and the issue rather than the actual person and you know what set of genetics they've got um, but when I say for instance citizenship ceremonies and it's very rare because most people are just brilliant but you'll get the old Muslim man that will refuse to shake your hand because you're a woman or I can't take this from a woman or I won't. I've had someone say to me, um, oh, look, I rang the male counsellor four times, but he didn't get back to me. So I'm ringing you now. I said, oh, great. Thanks. I'll get it sorted out for you. Doesn't matter if I'm a woman or not. But overall, I think people are pretty good. In fact, I think that uh, City of Casey residents actually like to have female counsellors. Now, I'm not interested in the gender politics, but it, they probably think we're going to be less tough, as in we're going to be a bit easier to talk to. And sometimes, look, I, I don't know, I've got, there's some very um, diplomatic male counsellors and um, I don't think gender really plays a role with our group. Well, there is the expression of woman's uh, touch. They, they, they're known as the, the gentler, more caring sex, but they can also be very feisty <laughs> as well. That's me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> No, that's fine. I'm look. I'm willing to relate to anyone, but um, I will let you know if um, if you're out of line, and and I usually get let known if, if I'm out of line too. So. Well, you're a, a mother as well, and you don't mess with mothers. Oh, that's right. We're very protective. I have a two great kids. I have a 16 year old, almost 16 year old son, and a 12 year old girl. So very proud. And my husband and I are very extremely proud of our children, and yeah, it's good. Now we've got a question here from Hugh Miller. Uh, what does, uh, where does she stand on free speech and the treasurer's announcement? Uh, I'm not sure um, if this is accurate, this one, about amendments to legislation to make reference to uh, Holocaust denial. Holocaust mm. denial what it, mm. uh, sh I think they're asking, should that be illegal? So there's two parts, I guess. So um, free speech, unfettered and I think free speech should be free-flowing um, and so in relation to the Holocaust denial I think that's horrific if he's trying to legislate um, sorry I'm not sure about whether he says that that person the treasurer is yeah yeah I, I um, haven't fact checked that, I, I that's think just Josh Frydenberg would be Jewish so I doubt look I don't know I'd have to look at the legislation proposed no. um, I think that there would be if someone wants to say that the Holocaust never happened, then I would, I think they should be questioned as a nut. Um, it, it, there's too many, I've met too many survivors. In fact, I attend every year a Holocaust remembrance ceremony and I meet a new survivor. In fact, last week I met a survivor and she's 94. I'm gonna go see her tomorrow. She's an artist. Um, these people have stories and they're genuine and they have the scars to prove it. Um, so, look, it, to, to be able to put into legislation to, sh to lock someone up for saying a denial, I would probably be against that, um, only because um, it would probably open the doors to lock someone up on the opposite end too. So, yeah, I do believe in free speech. Yeah, I'm a free speech absolutist as well. And, for example, social justice warriors, they can believe whatever they want to believe, but if they're blocking traffic mm. like they're doing this week, that's, no, that's not free speech. That is... Yes, I agree. And you know, it's interesting because I was talking to some state politicians who came to citizenship, for one fella at least, 
and he said there was unanimous support except for the animal justice um, that about the whole you know charging vegans charging farms and and bullying the farmers and trying to block the the abattoirs and that I mean the thing is you can have your views but when you start bullying when you start um, inhibiting someone's free flow of movement and uh, start threatening their farms I believe in gun ownership in that way now I don't mean <laughs> I just shocked you Tim now I don't mean shoot the gun at them but I'm saying you should be able to protect your farm and businesses and no don't block traffic that's for right. sure There's no way to do well, it. Well Carrie Ann Kenley she's in trouble again today because she just suggested using Extinction Rebellion protesters as speed bumps and don't feed them in jail. Oh God I love her um yes that is extreme but look hey I do believe in free speech so mm. whether or not um it's uh, helpful we'll see now i want to talk about uh, rise up australia they didn't r run in the 2018 state election you were the lead senate candidate at 2019 yes. federal election the party has chosen to voluntarily uh deregister now uh, yes. so can you explain the, the yes. reasoning behind that that's right so we did decide to de uh, to voluntary deregister and there's a number of reasons for that uh, we have um, believe we have met our goals um, the greatest goal we've met is we've uh, pastor who I, I know he's an apostle and prophet Daniel Nalaya he said that in tw by 2020 we'll have a born again prime minister who represents Christian values and will fight for this nation now that was said way before anyone think that was possible and so in t and of course uh, he was elected and he rose f rose into prominence and he took the leadership and we know now that he will be the leader next year and so that sort of brought to our goals a real um, resolution uh, we still uh, inform on policies and um, advise and we do have lobbyists and activists sort of roles still but we believe that we've you know we we need to and you know obviously legislation change making it a little bit harder for preferential voting to to allow mm. for a minor party the likes of motor enthusiasts to get in and that and of course that plays against um, the situation we were you know we were hoping that there would be another um, uh, sort of minor patriotic group to, to get in but I, I believe Pauline Hansen is holding the fort a little bit with that but it, it is it is um, filtered into the mainstream now I mean we're looking at we have a, a prime minister who is um, brilliant. Now, I remember sitting in citizenship ceremonies. I remember hearing his speech when he was the immigration minister. And I remember thinking, he's different. He's unlike anyone else. I like this man. And so when he took power, I just knew that Australia had arrived in so many ways. So I know he's got our back. Uh, he's not perfect yet, um, but I know that he is, he, he is got, he's holding the, the helm very well. Um, so Rise Up saw that is a reason to um, back down from politically uh, registering. Now, I, being in the political realm, it gives you a voice to speak into that realm as well. Whether or not you're of the, the you've got the numbers with you, it gives you a, a level of clout. And I think there's something significant as a minor um, player, you still have a large voice. You know, I think about, and I, it's interesting because I, I have a friend who's a Labor politician and, he's, and he said, have a look at this picture. It says, Made in Australia. And I said, wow, I hope to think we had something to do with that. And he said, I believe you did. And so, although, um, you know, p parties like Rise Up Australia emerged because there was a vacuum that formed when, you know, Labor and even, uh, sorry, Liberal and even Labor backed away from pr protecting some of those values like, like homegrown manufacturing and, uh, um, and uh, Australian made and Australian ownership and that sort of thing. So Rise Up brought back some of those values and, and focuses on, on things that the government had just sort of lost track, had fallen asleep at the wheel. And now there is, you see everywhere, Maine, Australia, this and that. That's great. I like to think that we had, we had done our part and we have, um, we have set the, helped set Australia back on track. Obviously we weren't alone. Uh, we have the likes of, you know, all, all the different groups that, that emerge. And, and you see one by one, they have, they have deregistered or they're, you know, they've amalgamated in some way. That's because the vacuum is closing, and that's that's good. That's good news for Australia. Because when Reclaim Australia and United Patriots Front were launched in 2015, that was before Pauline Hanson 2.0 was elected in in 2016, mm -hmm. and it's pretty much been since then that 
majority of Australian nationalists and patriots, they still see her as the, the best voting option because obviously there's there's not just Rise Up Australia, uh, there, there's been the Australian Liberty Alliance, the mm -hmm. Australian uh, Conservatives, and there was also Fraser Anning's uh, Conservative National Party. All of those mm -hmm. pr pretty much um, have been un unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they have much of a future or Australian Liberty Alliance have changed to, to Yellow Vests uh, Australia. But you can still do a lot as an activist, which mm -hmm. you've said Rise Up is is going to still continue to do. And yes. you can actually do quite a bit as an activist rather than... Because you can get support from anybody. While if you're a political party, everyone only has one vote. That's right. Mm. Absolutely. I, look, I hope we can continue informing the public and uh, we play into you know many voices that are speaking. We've helped contribute to the debate and the discussion. We're proud of that. Um, so, look, yeah, there, there has been this change of landscape. It'll be interesting to see what the next election holds. So, Well, Labor, the commentary now is that they're, they're down in the dumps. They don't know what they, they're going to stand for anymore. And I think Scott Morrison, uh, in his, well, before the election, especially after the Christchurch uh, massacre, he was very sort of uh, apologetic to playing to the ABC and the, the project, I remember he sat down with Walida Ali, which it didn't impress me much, but he's, mm. he's definitely with the, I was being called a Trumpian victory, but he described it as a miracle. He definitely feels that he has the, the confidence and because he coined that term quite Australians, that he can be, realize his true self and yes. he is being more um, patriotic himself with his speech to the Lowy Institute last week mm -hmm. uh, against globalism, uh, talking about the, the unaccountable unaccount unelected United Nations, which is mm -hmm. just in the news today. They, they might be close to being broke. Wow, that's good news. Mm. Yeah, and <laughs> saying that what well, democratic sovereign nations are the best best place people to, to make uh, decisions uh, on behalf of the people who who voted for them, which was very uh, refreshing. And uh, I think it's great that he and um, Trump have become uh, quite close. Absolutely. Um, that's really great news. Look how much Trump has done, even though he doesn't get credit for it. Mm -hmm. And um, the runs are on the board. This man has been brilliant at turning the nation around. I don't know if you remember, I think it was in my bio, spent seven years in America. So I love the American people, the culture and um, I've got a real heart for them as well. So seeing them diminish under Obama, it was heartbreaking. And so Trump was there. I mean, I don't like to use the term savior, but he, he really did turn the ship around for them. And for him to turn around and encourage our prime minister, this is a great alliance. And I believe there's more in the alliance like Boris Johnson, yes. possibly. Oh, well, Trump did describe himself once as the chosen one, which <laughs> well, he, He's, he's good at, uh, I, th I, I think, just uh, triggering his critics into, because that's the other thing that's happened. You talked about how the Americans, they felt destitute, but now mm. it's the elites in the United mm. States that they've become unhinged mm -hmm. and seen in MSNBC, the, the main two uh, establishment media networks, they're, they're just sporadic all over the place. Yes, that's right. Well, look, I think uh, if, he, if Trump has has good advisors around him and um, tries to keep him grounded. Uh, but that's just like any of us, I think. Um, but in your position, when there's a position of you're a world power and you're a leader in that world power, for sure. Um, but the, you could see through the everyday news stream, they are, they are spitting chips that he is in power. And it's becoming, it's becoming ridiculous that every second article is trying to tear down Trump and without the grounds for impeachment and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. I noticed the same is happening with Scott Morrison at the at the moment. There's all these articles popping up about he's got a friend who believes in Quanon and uh, referencing his his pastor friend Brian Brian Houston. Mm -hmm. What went on in the, the Hillsong Church? And then there's another rumor I won't mention in front of you, but just shows how mm. how desperate they are. And mm. as you talked about how Scott Morrison, he's born again Christian. He is a proper Christian. Yes. I mean, obviously Kevin Rudd, he said he was a he was a Christian, uh, but mm. you know, actions speak speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. But you you only had to see Scott Morrison in uh, in his, his local church. He mm -hmm. is really serious about his faith. Look, a, a big key indicator is if if 
someone is still with their wife since they were 17 and uh, you know I know marriages can be interesting but that's a great indicator he's a family man and very committed so it was good to see and um, yeah he's attending church and um, I'm, I'm grateful we have someone like that we, ha we have um, Prime Minister Morrison and um, obviously President Trump is a committed family man as well um, so look you know and I wonder if these news articles are actually emerging because of the close association with Trump and you know the fact that it's evident that they are um, growing closer and um, you know strengthening the alliance between the nations so I, you know and it, it almost becomes like a crying wolf are we paying much attention to these news because you know they're actually I know that perhaps people who aren't heavily involved in research may not uh, may just sort of swallow the news cycles but I hope that people can see that perhaps if someone's getting teared tear down so much and there's sort of fruitless claims and they still stay in power and they don't have people you know they're not been able to take down I wonder are they actually at fault I'd, I'd suggest no um, I know that's not always the case but in this case I believe he's been unfairly targeted both President Trump and now Prime Minister Morrison well, we noticed all the big social media companies there. I've, I'm not sure if you and Rise Up have had problems with social media uh, over the years, mm -hmm. but you can't even Google the news now because it just spits out all mm. CNN, uh, all this anti-Trump stuff, yes. where they just say, uh, Joe Biden's innocent, uh, Trump is corrupt and guilty, end of story. Yeah, I, I actually pay attention to it every day. And the reason I do that is I like to look into the enemy's camp uh, to be able to keep um, abreast of all this, you know, what they're what they're on about. Um, so, look, I think that there is news outlets like Unshackled uh, that that you can get the real news, and um, certainly you've got to go digging for some others. That's for sure. So, but I encourage the Australian public to stay informed and just rebuild, you know, go dig deeper. Usually, though. Um, the mainstream Australia are actually quite um, conservative in their in their values, believe it or not. I, I do truly believe that. And so we have a prime minister that's representative of, you know, of mainstream Australia. Absolutely. Now, I want to talk about the, the future of the, the city of Casey because mm -hmm. there'll be more people who will settle in the area. How do you... I, it's out of your control, obviously, as a local councillor, mm -hmm. but it's the, the federal government that sets the, the immigration quota. Mm -hmm. They've brought it down from 190,000 to 160,000, which mm -hmm. is it's slightly less, but like they're all going to your area. Mm -hmm. So do you have, what's your opinion on it overall? Yeah. So immigration is important to Australia and, you know, it might be different to some other um, some others but I do actually support migration I think it's great I don't support mass migration I think we should be you know screening people especially for crimes and um, and to ensure the safety of this nation the city of Casey is such a great success story we have 150 nationalities residing in um, our borders there's 8.1 people per hectare so it's still getting populated the challenge of living together, uh, 150 different nationalities. How is it working really well? Um, I, you know, I've got a couple of theories, and I have a couple of actual evidence um, as well. I'd like to say it like this: Now we have, you know, the Sri Lankans went through two bloody civil wars very recently in history. I know quite a few Sri Lankans, and we have a high Sri Lankan population. There was only three ethnic groups involved there. They're at each other's throats. There was obviously religious uh, overtones, yeah, but the, it was the ethnic lines. and Tamils. The Tamils, that's right. And so, but the three ethnic groups within that country, and you know, you've got two ethnic groups in in African nations that are tearing each other apart as well. What makes 150 nationalities actually get along in the city of Casey? And I tell you this, it is a place where they come for. It's a safe haven. It's a place of peace. That's that's how we've tried to to cultivate that. Now, I know we have some social challenges that have come come and gone and how to get along and that's just everyday people living in close, uh, uh, close proximity. But this is the thing. We have an underlying common ground of respect and um, you know valuing of family and you want your children to grow up in a place of safety and peace. I've had, when we were um, discussing the mosque recently in Narry North, 
there was migrants that were coming to me saying, I don't want this thing. I came from a place that, um, you know, was, was horrific with things like this. I came here, the city of Casey, to, to get away from that. I wanted to come somewhere safe, away from it all, in a part of the world that was safe and secure. And, you know, even Muslims have come to me and said they don't want these things. So they want to live in peace as well and escape the country of origin that was under such oppression in different ways. Um, Chinese have, have uh, conveyed to me how peaceful it is here away from communism. I've got Romanian friends, I'm dear, dear friends that are in my inner circle. They said, we lived under it, we understand what it's like, and they come here, they feel free. And so I'm fiercely pr protective of, of city of Casey, and I will say that I will, you know, I will fight to the death for their protection, um, because I believe that we have to, we have to keep uh, being vigilant and making sure that if there's any threats, any, you know, keeping, um, keeping a sword in one hand and, and building in the other, just like Nehemiah in the Bible. So we, we have to be careful that we don't lose that peace and freedom. We've had, um, we, there was a spate of home invasions, um, the, a few of the, the different gangs and that. They's, those have moved on overall. We've had some crime issues and of course the, the Victorian police have responded really well. State government funded some more policing, which has been great. And we have some great enforcement services in there. So, so it has improved there because mm. Cranbourne was particular African crime yeah. hotspot. And so there is uh, quietly things being done about it. That's right. And even Fountain Gate has been in the news a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, I go there with my kids at night and I don't feel unsafe. And it's just those, there's, you know, sprinkle of spots. And it, that's just like with anything that you hear, you, you might hear the, sort of the, the snippets here and there. Um, overall, I think we're great. Uh, the, one of the greatest concerns that I have, that I know the stats were represent, and that's the issues with domestic violence and alcohol, fuel violence. We've done some work on that to try to limit the amount of outlets and that sort of thing. So there is other issues that obviously with, you know, 355,000 people, there's always going to be those those challenges and throwing alcohol in the mix as well. Because I noticed the the federal member for La Trobe, Jason Wood, Liberal, who was, it was just re-elected, he's now the mm -hmm. Assistant Minister for Multicultural Affairs and mm -hmm. obviously takes in a lot of the areas and that's the, the crime in the area that's something he wants addressed as well. He's a former policeman himself. That's right. And he's also um, counter-terrorism as well, he's done as well. So I really respect Jason Wood. Uh, I, I get along quite well with Jason and um, I can see he's very, uh, he fights very hard for his community. So, you know, we have the likes of Anthony Byrne, member for Holt, uh, the uh, Honourable Anthony Byrne, and he's actually on the, the deputy uh, chair of the National Security Council. We have, you know, we've got people from both sides of politics. He's actually quite conservative, Anthony Byrne. Yeah, he is. He's very conservative. So we just say he's, he's a really a liberal dressed up. <laughs> no, I, look, I, the works of Anthony Byrne, the likes of Anthony Byrne, he's, um, fights very hard and that's why he stayed in for so long as well, because he does fight very hard for his community. Jason Wood, um, and, uh, there's a, Gillian Hill is in the north as well. He's Labor. I haven't had much to do with J Gillian yet, but Look, I think there's possible to work with everyone if you can. And the common ground of safety is something that no one disagrees with. And so that cross, that's by the tripartisan even, um, that will cross all, all political lines. Now, I'd say you're one of the most successful patriot politicians uh, in Australia. And based on what you've said there, you've been able to, you haven't been a, a outcast or a, a be made a, a pariah. You've had constructive relationships with people across the, the politics, but you've never compromised your beliefs. And so for those patriots who would like to get politically active, what mm -hmm. advice would you, you give them? Yeah, well, thank you, Tim. That's nice. I don't always think of myself like that. But I would say the best piece of advice is to respect those who are already in leadership, where, wherever their seat resides. And and the, the thing is, is respect for authority has diminished. So we need to acknowledge and respect those, whether we agree with them or not, um, be very uh, respectful and positive towards our prime minister, towards those politicians who are in power, whether they're not our first choice or not. And, you know, we can call out their, their uh, policies as, as perhaps, um, you know, uh, detrimental, but don't attack the person 
and I always look to the humanity of someone. So I know, for instance, and I even met Daniel Andrews um, a couple of times, and I told him to stop safe schools and everything, but I still respect the seat. And so he's been, any of us, we're in position of power, and that includes our colleagues. There's some that just rub me up the wrong way occasionally, but I respect their seat because they, they were elected democratically and they represent the hundreds and thousands of people that it represented them. So having respect for them is having respect for Australians. So as far as um, how to continue to be successful, I think um, to be honest, to be to hold true to convictions and do it for the right reasons and um, don't back down don't back down and, and take get get rid of fear i had to get rid of, and it's only it's been a slow process but to be bold and um because there's this lot of we you know what if they don't accept me and when you said that i've i haven't been um outcast well <laughs> that's not entirely true i have um suffered under uh, sometimes isolation oh i forgot to invite council chris Daly. Oh, didn't do that but that's okay you, you sort of you don't take it personally you say okay they had their reasons um and uh you you try to be as respectful as you can and try to get on with it and that that's what i would say get on with it and move past the angst as quickly as you can and move forward to the next um, next victory and even the next loss take it on the chin and keep working hard so hmm. yeah oh that's that's nice advice and we'll see um how many uh, absorb it it sounds like you could be a good mentor as well oh thank you well you too oh. yeah. <laughs> And now we, we are just going up to, to 8.15. I've really enjoyed uh, our discussion tonight because we've, we've been able to basically go through your, your whole career, rise up your, your activism. It's, it's mm -hmm. been, hopefully I've provide, provided a platform to give you a good profile that uh, five minutes on the news uh, wouldn't. <laughs> now, Tim, that's just been brilliant because oftentimes I get edited out and um, this is quite refreshing because you see me in my raw state and um, I'm really grateful to you and I thank you for your work and you've probably been the subject of persecution and all sorts of name calling, but I'm sure you've got thick skin now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got a present for you. Oh, really? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. I wasn't so expecting so now this is, is okay because i want to walk the talk right this is an australian made product australian crafted it's actually mine but i don't want to provoke the name it's more about walking the talk so if you believe in australian crafted and made then 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 adopt it into your business oh you don't have to promote the oh, name i just want to I'm show just, what it is <laughs> it's actually a little car portable diffuser but it's, it's one of my top sellers. i just have a micro business but I just want to encourage people to adopt the model of really trying to buy from local suppliers, pr promote local business, um, just so we can keep building to the future. So that's a present for you, and oh. I'll give, I'll leave one for Dave. Is it Dave as well? I oh, know. Who's the other guy that's with you? Steel. A uh, Steel, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave one for Dave. Steel. Is my co-host on the oh, Uncuckables okay. tomorrow night. Oh right, right, okay. Which is so. eight thirty p.m. Melbourne time on the Uncuckables channel. Mm -hmm. uh, we do, uh, everyone will leave the, the chat in a moment to go and watch uh, Dear Bell Trans weekly live stream. Uh, she's got uh, Carolee Smith, who used to be Halal Choices. Now yes. uh, she leads Binary Australia, which she's basically advocating that there's only two genders. That's basically a job now. Okay. Well, yeah, last time I looked, there was only two, but we, have well, to have we a, represent the two here. <laughs> we, we have to have a lobby group to... <laughs> That's right. Well, I applaud Kira Lee and I know that we've had interactions on and off and she's um, done some great work. And uh, I think we've touched, we've crossed paths in the patriotic movement a fair bit. So wish her all the best. And I think that's an important cause. We, we need to know who we are and let the kids know it's okay to promote that. Yeah, definitely. Now, I'll be back again on Friday evening for another episode of Wilmsfront, uh, 7 p.m. Melbourne time, uh, same channel. Uh, my colleague uh, Steel Archer, his uh, detonation program is now on his own dedicated YouTube channel that's live what, most weekday mornings around about 11 a.m. So make sure you not only have you got to subscribe to a YouTube channel, but you've got to click the bell to announce notifications. Uh, otherwise, YouTube won't tell you that it's going live. And of course, uh, Trans Tasman Talk uh, that I host with uh, my New Zealand counterpart, uh, Dewey DeBoer of Right Minds, that is 7 p.m. every Tuesday evening Melbourne time on the Unshackled YouTube channel. That is also the home of the uh, report from Tiger Mountain with Richard Wollstonecroft. I also upload highlights from Wilmsfront episodes 
there. You can also access Wilms Front as a podcast form on your favorite favorite pod podcasting platform, Apple, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and Stitcher. The same with the Uncarkables, that's also in podcast form. And also, if you want to support the, the show, a uh, few people did uh, tonight by sending through a, a super chat. You can become an Unshackled member at theunshackled.net slash membership, or you can donate at theunshackled.net slash donate. We're also on patreon.com slash theunshackled and paypal.me slash theunshackled. And also check out the archive of episodes on rationalrise.tv. That's the free speech self-hosted video platform set up by James Fox Higgins of the Rational Rise. And please check out the, the archive at timwilms.com, which is the dedicated show website, has all the links to follow me on social media. So I'm on facebook.com slash wilmsfront, twitter.com slash wilmsfront, gab.com slash timwilms, and also minds.com slash timwilms. So thank you once, once again, Rosalie. Thank you, Tim. It's been an honor. And we'll, be, we'll, we'll definitely catch up again soon. That'd be good. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.